my first trip to France was in 1993, and I went out there and I stood and looked across the field where Luke died, and I couldn't make sense of the story. I was reading that he jumped over a stone wall, that he died in a cemetery, that you know all these different things that happened that were written by all these different authors from the 20s all the way through the 60s. And when I stood there and I looked at the place where people said he died, it didn't fit. It didn't fit logistically. Well, in 1999, myself, Amy Thornton, and Stephen Lawson met at the Lafayette Foundation. At the time, they were based in Colorado Springs, and we spent like four or five days, almost a full week, going through thousands of boxes, and I mean thousands, and, and Stephen and, and Amy will tell you this. We went in, and there was this huge room, this storage room lined on all sides, like six feet high, with boxes on top of boxes on top of boxes, and every one of those boxes contained thousands of individual files. So Steve would go through the boxes and he would say, okay, there's no chance that any of the fry files will be in this box. Could be in this one. Not in this one. Could be in this one. Then Amy Thornton would grab the could be boxes and she would look through for anything remotely related to the 1st Pursuit Group or the 27th Aero Squadron or Frank Luke. If there was anything in there, then she would pass it on down to me. I would determine whether or not it was relevant, whether it actually came from the original Fry, file, fry Files. And after like a week, we finally reassembled for the first time in 30 years. Rediscovered, reassembled, put everything back together, and the Fry Files were there again. And that is when, when I thought, okay, now that this much has been done, now, I think we can write a book. I had a whole set of maps that I had collected from France and from German archives and, and all over the world. And every night when I go to bed, I would get all those maps. And my wife would say, well, you put those stupid maps away. And I probably did this for four months, nonstop trying to figure out the mystery of what happened when Lansing Holden, Granville Woodard, and Frank Luke all flew over Dunsermuz at approximately the same time. There was a way to figure that out, and I couldn't wrap my mind around it. So for months, every night I would go to bed, and I would sit there for 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half at a time, with all these maps all laid out over the bed. And every night she'd go, well, you put those stupid maps away. And finally, one night, I go, I got it! I figured it out! And she goes, thank goodness, will you put the maps away now? And uh, so that's the kind of obsession that it turned into over a period of time. And the whole experience for me has been overwhelming. And I have looked at this as my life's contribution to World War I aviation study. And I've had a lot of people say, well, you know, what, what's your next book going to be on? There is no plan for another book. <laughs> I don't know if I ever want to do another book. I mean, this one took 15 years, and I don't want to do a derivative work. I don't want to go back and, and, and rewrite what somebody else has already written before. To me, the only justification for writing a book is to do something that is world-class, totally original, and has new, undiscovered information. And if I can't do that, I don't want to do another book. Never in history has the Luke family come forward and said, we endorse this work. Never. Not for an article, not for a book, not for anything. Uh, so I went over in May of 2007, sat down, had a great meeting with the family, and I forget how many, there was 20-something people there. I mean, it was, it was Don and Deborah Luke's house was full. And uh, it just came away with a fantastic sense and, and a connection with the Luke family. All of them. All the people there. They were just wonderful to me. So um, I went back home. And I thought, okay, now that I've showed them what I have, I want to send them the manuscript. And I sent it to them blind, and it was like, you know, I have no idea. I, I, we've only met once. These people don't really know me that well. Uh, they may shred it. They may take it and send it to the Phoenix Republic. or You know, who knows what they're going to do. I mean, this, I have no idea what I'm doing here. But I'm going to send it to them anyway as an act of faith. They were super nice, super kind people, and I'm going to see what happens. And of course, you know, I was worried to death. Uh, but I figured if, if they believe in this project, then they'll stand behind it. And I also thought, from their standpoint, from the Luke's standpoint, this is the last generation of the Lukes who will really have much of a connection. Every generation gets further and further away. 
So if they're ever going to stand behind a work, now is the time. And my job was to convince them that this needs to be done. If you're not going to stand behind my book, then hire another historian, send him out there, but find somebody who can tell the final true story of Frank Luke Jr. And when you find that person, stand behind their work. Well, they liked it. And of course, I was just on cloud nine. That, that to me, was one of the crowning achievements of everything that I had poured 15 years into. Uh, the fact that they believed in it enough to come on board and say, yes, we will officially authorize this and endorse this as the authorized biography of Frank Luke. Not just the story of his death, the entire officially authorized biography of his life and death meant a tremendous amount to me personally. Um, and, and I consider it um, one of the crowning achievements of everything out of 15 years worth of work.